we have a series of speakers to speak to you today, and then Connie will do some summing up at the end. Connie Sorio, our Migrant Justice Program Coordinator. Um, my name is Shannon Neufeld. I'm the member and network coordinator from Kairos, and uh, just again, so glad to see you all here. Yeah. And I have just met Jazzer. Uh, Jazzer is Hi. Um, a health practitioner on an international student visa in Canada. The registered nurse in the Philippines and responded to the call for health practitioners to boost human resources in the COVID-19 uh, affected long-term care facilities. And so he's going to share a little bit of his story with us. Welcome Jazzer, go ahead. Yeah, so hi, good afternoon. I'm Jazzer Montiliano, 32 years old. I came from the Philippines. So back home, I was a nurse and practicing as a nurse. So I'm, make, I'm here for further study. So my class should start like yesterday. But because of this pandemic thing, it was moved to September. So basically, I don't know what to do. I have my class being different. Like I can do nothing but stay at home. Just stay at home. So so I can do work until my classes start because that's what my permit allows me that I cannot go to work until until my classes start because or else I could be illegal. So I have nothing but hearing about COVID things from my country here in Canada, in America, or everywhere. So hearing these COVID stories, so as a health practitioner, I want to help, I want to do something, but I simply can't because of my, my restrictions given by the immigration. So until I hear I read a post from Facebook that the Canadian government is looking for every health workers residing now in Canada, even students or even like currently in Canada that can help in COVID, in fighting the COVID. So long story short, I volunteer without any hesitation. I said how to apply, I volunteered. So in summary, I was, assigned to a covid stricken long-term care facility in Toronto. And the thing there was on my first day, somebody died. I think, oh, wow, so this is it. So I did a post-mortem care in the first hour. So, so that's it. So one thing also I discovered that the staffs are being infected and nobody wants to go to work anymore. So. So one thing is after your shift, an eight hour shift, you are never sure if you can go home because you have to wait somebody the, somebody to take over your shift. So on the second day, it happened. I worked straight 16 hours. So like, oh, so this is the normal thing here. So on the third day, I worked like 12 hours. So, oh, this is bad. So. Although that thing has keep on happening, I did continue until weeks after I feel like something's happening to me. So the nurse assigned that day said to me, Jasser, you have to, I have to swab you and to be tested. So I was tested, I was swabbed, I was positive. So that's so what's that's what's happening to me. So Today is my 12th day of isolation. Two more days, I, two more days, it's the 14th day, uh, like this Thursday, I will be swapped again. So I'm hoping for the results to be good. So yes, we have PPE there. We have all sorts of protection. In fact, we work as a team. We help each other. We, we see each other, we, we, we suggest. To just to keep things better and better. But what I'm trying to say here is the whole system. Like me as a foreign worker and my and my 
co-worker is like we are facing the same risk we are facing the same enemy we are doing the same work but the both of us have we don't have equal same protection because i can say that because even i don't have i can't even have a valid health card until now because of this immigration thing i can't because there's so many restrictions i can't i can't i can't get so now that i'm sick i don't know if they have something for me but one thing is for sure because i'm a health professional wherever i will be i must respond if somebody wants me so now in behalf of the international students the temporary foreign workers i call for equal same protection because i believe my work and profession is essential that's it <laughs> that's it thank you thank you very much jazzer yeah. um as soon as i heard that you know jazzer was in self isolation i yeah. can him and also to ask what kind of support he needs because i know that he's he's here by himself he has no yeah. you know, uh immediate relatives and and as an international student uh responding to a call it is very important that you know we take care of each other so yeah later on we'll you know talk about you know what kind of advocacy we should be doing thanks shan thank you again so we're going to hear a number of stories and then at the at the end after everyone has had a chance to speak there will be an opportunity to ask the the people who have shared uh, any questions you might have and i'd like now to call on sevilla a long time personal support worker sevilla welcome here and thank you for being with us by the health caregiver i have more than 12 years experience from uk and canada I look after a client who has dementia, Alzheimer's, cerebral palsy, uh, with physical needs, and others. My background is in finance, but what I have, but why I have to switch my career and became a caregiver because I'm proud of, of it and do it with humility, respect, dignity, and, and its integrity. It's an eye-opening for me when my mother deteriorated and suffered and my family has no choice. It's heartbreaking, but we have to hire a caregiver for her. And I saw the love, effort, hardships, and the care and the love that uh, this caregiver showed to my mother and somehow alleviated her pain. And that's why it is a great challenge for me to pursue this career. I consider it as extremely important and very essential in our community and society. It, involves hard work, dedication, patience, with great empathy, care, passion, and be compassionate to do this job. At times we've been overlooked, harassed verbally and physically, but we deserve to be, have a deep breath and do our duties. On the bright side of it, our boss and families, client gave us the compliment and appreciated our good job. During this COVID time, I could just stay home and apply for CERB, but because of the demand and needs of clients, we can't do it. We have to have the courage, the strength, guts, and to continue this job and pursue our service, knowing that the risk is very high and the gravity of the situation is enormous. The sad part of it, we've been discriminated, stereotyped, labeled misjudged, and misunderstood, belittled by other people, as I myself experienced a month ago, I'm not welcome by a couple where I used to live, saying that I could bring the virus to them. It hurts me a lot, but I have no choice but to move on. From the bottom of my heart, I am pleading to our government that somehow, on behalf of my co-caregivers, PSWs, have to be acknowledged and considered that they should have the, they deserve to have a permanent residence and not just uh, work and permit alone. And the skills and the education professionally has to be acknowledged, especially we uh, Filipinos who's really professionally inclined and we have really the capability to do the job. 
so I'm really asking the government that please reconsider because we are people that somehow are considered caregiver and PSWs or and in healthcare, we are essential and really important in the community and society. And that's why I'm here and it's really overwhelming for me that somehow I'm included in this uh, talk and that's, I wish I have a great sense of what I'm saying and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sevilla. We really appreciate you sharing your story. And you'll stay with us, right? And maybe people will have questions for you in a little bit. Sure. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Some others who would have liked to have been here are not able to be here in the middle of the work day. And so um, we have some stories and I am going to read one of them from another caregiver. And so it, in her voice, um, I will read now. I'm 45 years old, separated with three children left in the care of my parents in the Philippines. I was a public high school teacher in the Philippines, but my sal salary was not enough to support my children and my aging parents. I was forced to leave teaching and my country to find work that would allow my children to go to school have decent, safe housing, and food on the table. After eight years in Saudi Arabia, I came to Canada in May 2018 as a temporary foreign worker under the Care for Elderly pilot program. I had to pay about $8,000 to an agency who found me an employer and processed all my documents. My dream is to finish the 24-month work requirement, pass the language test, and be able to apply for permanent residency in Canada, and then re reunite with my children. The job was going well caring for one elderly woman. My employer was happy with my work and the way I looked after her. There were only the two of us in the house. We were respectful of each other. I learned to care for her like my mother. However, this was abruptly disrupted in mid-March when the eldest daughter decided to bring her mother to the nursing home. My employer and I were both shocked and did not know how to react. The day my employer was brought to the nursing home, she asked me to accompany her. I cannot describe how I felt when we got to the nursing home and leaving her there. It was so hard. On our way out, we were advised by the in-house medical practitioner to follow the public health advisory to self-isolate for 14 days because the facility was dealing with a COVID-19 outbreak. As soon as we reached home where I stayed with my employer, the daughter told me to look for another employer and vacate the premises in three days. I was shocked and devastated. Where would I go? Where would I find a new employer at this time of the pandemic? I pleaded with her and explained that I didn't have any relatives or anyone that could provide temporary accommodation, but she didn't relent. On the third day, the daughter phoned me and asked me if I was ready to leave and gave me instructions where to leave the house key. Pushed to the wall, I told her, I'm not leaving. I reminded her of the medical practitioner's advice to self-isolate for 14 days. I told her that if she forced me to leave, I will report her to the authorities, including with the Ministry of Labor for violating my rights. I think she was stunned. She could not speak for almost a minute. And then she said, okay. I felt really good about standing up for my rights. Now I'm still living in the same house and I was assured that the family will honor the remaining time of the two year contract. In the meantime, my employer, Nana, I call her Nana for grandmother, wants to come home. She feels safer in the house with me caring for her than in the nursing home still fighting the virus outbreak. 
I've uh, been asked to um, relate the story of Christina. My name is Cheryl McNamara, and I work at Kairos as the media and advocacy coordinator. My name is Christina. I am a temporary foreign worker providing care to children under the Caring for Children pilot program. I arrived in Canada in 2018 and am about to complete the 24 months work requirement this month, April, and I will be qualified to apply for permanent residence. I worked in Hong Kong for 10 years as a domestic helper. I am married and have four children. My husband is a jeepney driver and his earnings are not enough to support us, hence I was forced to leave my family and work as a caregiver. I was an live out caregiver caring for three children. This arrangement is very expensive for me as I have to maintain an apartment and pay for my daily transportation, but I also like the freedom and having not to worry about work and the children after 6 p.m. and be able to take a rest and be ready for the next day's work. When the pandemic hit the province and public safety measures were imposed, including locking down offices, public spaces, and minimizing travel and use of public transit, my employer paid for my Uber ride. She felt that it was safer to take the Uber uh, than being exposed in the bus or subway. After all, she wants to make sure that my exposure is limited for the sake of her children and household. This arrangement went for a week and a half. Um, coming back from the weekend off, she called Sunday afternoon and told me that she will not be paying for my Uber anymore. Um, that if I wanted to take an Uber to work, then I will have to pay for it. I asked her what changed. The outbreak was getting worse and more people were getting infected and taking an Uber was not only for my safety, but for her family as well. Anyway, I said I had to think about it. A couple of hours later, I received a termination letter. It was very harsh. It said I was terminated for insubordination and not doing my job to their satisfaction. This happened the end of March. To date, I am still waiting for my annual leave pay, the two weeks pay in lieu of notice as per the Employment Standards Act, my record of employment so I can file for EI or other benefit packages. I recently applied for SIR, but I don't know if I qualify because I'm still under the temporary foreign worker program. And that's Christine's statement. Thanks, Cheryl, for uh, sharing that one as well. So now I think we may have one more guest if she's able to join us in a little bit later, but Right now, I'd like to turn it over to Connie Sorio to uh, give us a little bit of a summary of what she's noticed in these various stories and more that she has heard. Um, thank you, Shannon and Cheryl, for reading those stories. Um, these are real people, and I have contact with them almost every day. And it was hard for me to, to read the letters uh, and, 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 and I mean the stories because I, you know, I, I have relations, I've built a relationship with them and I could feel uh, the pain and the injustice that they're facing. Um, just to mention too that uh, I just got a text from Michelle and she is not able to join us because she uh, she was called on to stay on duty and she has to attend to patients. Mi Michelle is, um, is a registered care facility that, you know, uh, Jasser also uh, worked uh, before. And it was her actually that, you know, when we were connecting with each other, uh, I really felt, you know, the urgency of of you know the situation at the at the long term care facility, as Jazzer has mentioned, you know described, um, workers have stopped coming to work because either they they are infected or they're just scared to to bring you know uh, the infection home. So at one point I was talking to Michelle and 
and in between her in between us talking she was also attending to 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 a patient so i um I, I really felt for her, and one of in in one of our discussions, she highlighted, you know, the the crisis that they are facing, but particularly in a publicly funded uh, long long term uh, care facilities. And I would like actually to 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 refer you to a Globe and Mail article that came out yesterday. And uh, the title is, It Took a Pandemic, Why Systemic Deficiencies in Long-Term Care Facilities Pose Such a Danger to Our Seniors. What the article highlighted, you know, um, not only the crisis in terms of, uh, um, I wouldn't say overcrowding, but the fact that, you know, the current cuts that we're, we're experiencing under the current government has made it impossible for, for long-term care facilities to be able to hire sufficient or enough workers to be able to provide the care necessary or that's needed in, in these facilities. And the pandemic has clearly highlighted, you know, uh, the shortage uh, the long hours of work uh, that these workers have to, to endure and, and the not sufficient care that's provided to, to the residents. And, and as we, you know, as we've been hearing in the news, most of the facilities are currently, you know, uh, suffering from the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. And the need for workers is not going to go away. Um, Canada has an, you know, has an aging uh, population and the need for health workers, care workers uh, is very much needed. So hearing from Jazzer's story from Sevilla and also from Carol and Christina, it really highlighted, you know, uh, the need to to overhaul our system or over, overhaul our immigration uh, system to make sure that one, workers that we need that are doing essential work should be provided with permanent residency because the work they're doing are not temporary. These are permanent jobs. And, and those you know, who are coming here as health professionals should be recognized as health professionals. There should be, you know, their foreign training, their, their international training and, and profession should be recognized because it's needed. So, for, for, for example, for Jezer, he's a registered nurse in the Philippines and he, he came, uh, he just arrived actually in February this year as an international student. Um, it does not recognize, you know, his profession as a registered nurse in the Philippines. But responding to the call, you know, he stepped out and said, well, I'm a registered nurse in the Philippines. I can, I can do the work. And the fact that, you know, uh, Jazar is currently infected, um, he is in a limbo in terms of health coverage. His old hip is not valid until the class starts, which has, which has been moved to September of this year. And, and for the meantime, what, what is Jasser going to do? What are international students who are in similar situations and are coming out and providing service, the much needed and essential service are going to do? So these are the, these are the, the questions and these are the realities that we're facing today. And, you know, um, despite the fact that the government, both federal and provincial uh, have come out with, you know, um, aid packages and the CERB and so forth, more attention should be given to the international, international students who are here, the temporary foreign workers are providing essential work, that they should be given the same access the same benefits that we all have as Canadians or permanent residents. Um, I would like to, yeah, Shannon, like, you know, let's open it up for question and, you know, answer in terms of, you know, our, our participants uh, being able to learn from us. 
Sure, Connie. So we have uh, here uh, Sevilla, Jazzer, and Connie are all available to answer your questions. And so I would invite you to simply um, take turns and unmute yourselves um, to ask what's on your mind. I just would start out by thank saying you thank you for the work you're doing. It's really essential work. And uh, I've actually worked in healthcare and really have a sense of how much nurses and personal care workers do and, um, you know, caring for our loved ones. That's, it's so important, really. Um, the most important work maybe. I think in terms of question, the question I really have is how um, can we step into advocacy um, and, and support um, uh, transitions in our immigration program to better support uh, these workers so that healthcare workers can get permanent residency more easily. These caregivers who we depend on should not be stuck in the temporary status. And then in terms of what's happening now with uh, international students and others who um, are not able to um, benefit from the healthcare supports that our country has, how can we advocate uh, for them? Thank you. Connie, do you want to go ahead and answer that now? Um, maybe we should wait for other questions as well, if you don't mind, Elizabeth, because uh, later part of, you know, our conversation will focus on advocacy and mobilizing and engaging our constituents and, you know, to support that. Um, I had a question for Jazzer, and I, I wonder if um, how you've been feeling, and and if the if you were feeling very ill, and if you um, had support during the time of your illness, or or now, what has your situation been like in the last two weeks? Yeah, I'm, if we're talking about right now, I'm perfectly fine. So I'm last week. I'm just. I feel like I. I thought it was just a simple flu, a simple cold. Like I have don't. I don't cough. I just feel like my sense of smell has gone. I have no appetite on eating. I just love to sleep. I think. Well, well, this is a simple symptoms of flu or whatever, like maybe I got the flu. But when I was tested and it was positive, so I told to stay here at the basement alone. So luckily I have I have a supportive parents way in in California, in America. They are sending me through DHL because when I, the, the public health is like telling me that we have those groups like grocery heroes that do the, do the grocery for me and I will pay them on how much the receipt will, will do. But when I started to use it, they're asking me different questions like, are you a worker in these facilities? And I, because I'm a temporary worker, I can't give the... I can't give the exact things they are asking, so it was a failure. So, so my help was from America. They do it on the DHL, like they pay more. Just arrive my my bread, my everything I need, the food I want. It lasted for two weeks, so that's it. Uh, so that's my help. It's costly on their side, on my side, and. Thanks, thanks God that my symptoms were just like that compared to what we used to hear. Like you can't, I can have a difficulty of breathing. No, there's not something like that for me because maybe because I'm, 
I'm a nurse. I eat a lot. I eat more fluids. I help myself. <laughs> I eat more vitamins because I don't. That's the thing. Even though I don't have appetite, I just eat, 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 and rest, rest, rest. So everything is good for me now. Well, we're glad it wasn't such a horrendous case, and that you took care of yourself, and that you're feeling better. Yeah. Um, it's it's heartrending to hear that. Even with the volunteer programs like Grocery Heroes, you still fall between the cracks yeah. because you don't have those, that permanent status. Yeah, because like they're asking an email that connected to the facility because they have to make sure that I'm a healthcare worker, I'm a pump liner. So, but I can't give something like that. I can't. So, that's a failure. So, I don't. Right. And there's a question in the chat here. Um, do you know of instances when the support workers in LTC have been given increased pay? Can any of our speakers answer that? So LTC long-term care, right? Do you know of instances when support workers have been given increased pay? Um, to uh, Dia, in yes. your in your uh, experience, as of today, we haven't heard anything yet. Even though the uh, Ford is already saying that there's a kind of increase or something, but I haven't heard from our boss yet. So mm -hmm. it's negative still. <laughs> no. Well, if you have to follow up, because uh, based on the announcements that, you know, uh, was made, I think it was yesterday, uh, that about $6 increase per hour uh, mm -hmm. for long-term care uh, workers, especially those in the front line, you know, you should get this increase. Yes. So you deserve it, Sevilla. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Connie, may I ask a question? Yes, Andrea. Thank you. Uh, apologies for joining late. I wondered, uh, are you finding any differences in the experiences of workers uh, from province to province? Uh, I understand that the program is a federal one, but uh, are workers having different experiences in different parts? of the country. Mm -hmm. um, I Thank attended you. a webinar organized by a group in New Brunswick, and this is the New Brunswick Media Co-op, and they have speakers uh, that did a research study on long-term care facilities and so forth, and what, what was brought out, you know, from, from that conversation is that it's, it's, it's the same uh, experiences, uh, long hours of work, many, uh, the ratio of workers to, uh, to patients or to clients is very high. Um, a worker has to, has to provide care to 10 to 15, you know, people in the, in the facility. Uh, during during her uh, shift, which is normally eight hours, but then usually extended to 12 and 16 hours. So workers are feeling burnt out and the pay is still very low. So I'm hoping that, you know, um, the, the province, New Brunswick, would follow suit in terms of increasing uh, the salaries of frontline health workers, just like what, you know, Ontario had announced yesterday. But it's also, and, and if you read the, the article that Kathy Tomlinson from Globe and Mail uh, has written, they did a very good research and analysis on the, the healthcare and elderly, you know, uh, seniors care. And it really showed, you know, how, how deficient we are or how deficient is both the federal and the provincial government in providing the much needed funding to boost, you know, manpower and also the facilities in terms of um, access to, to medical supplies and, and, and so forth. So what this pandemic, you know, has brought to light, you know, is 
how very deficient we are in providing care for our seniors. And, and you know, we're hoping that before the end of our webinar, we'd be able to focus on some advocacy work that we need to do to, you know, to make sure that things, policies are changing, things are changing to make sure that, you know, our seniors are provided the best care they, they, they can receive and that our workers are provided, you know, uh, access to benefits and the same, uh, the same rights, uh, whether you are here under a temporary status or as Canadian or permanent residents. Um, yeah. There was another question in the chat. And Jazzer, I think you referred to this briefly. Um, the question was, can any of the speakers speak to whether they have enough personal protective equipment given from the employer? Jazzer, do you want to start? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm luckily the I'm lucky that I was assigned to that facility with with complete PPE. Uh, everything is given. I thought I we gonna out of stuff, but every day when I go there, uh, from gowns to gloves to goggles to mask, and with the mask with the eye protection, they're all there. Like, it's maybe because like the only problem with the the long term care facilities is the ratio of the patient and the worker because I think it's sometimes like for one PSW we're caring of ten residents so the time we have like we have to take care of them and in that limited time so that's the challenge there. Thank you. Sevilla, did you want to speak to that? What about in your situation? Yes, On, in my experience, I'm really pleased with my boss who have a continuous support towards us to, make, to ensure that uh, the staff has a proper PPE because otherwise I'm a person that if there's no complete PPE, I'm going to reject the job. I'm not gonna do it and I'm not gonna take the risk because that's for my side that I have really to be careful with it. But so far, I'm so grateful with my boss. Thank you. Okay. And Connie, are you hearing stories anywhere else? Is that, is it pretty good? Or are there places where there isn't enough equipment? Um, there are places where, you know, they're lacking the PPE, the ventilators, and the protective masks. Uh, but yes, so that's, that's you know, uh, that's a fact. But also, as Jazzer pointed out, and I mentioned earlier, the ratio is very high uh, in terms of residents and workers. And so really, uh, to be able to do the proper, you know, the proper care, sanitation, and all that um, self-care is very hard when you're faced to, uh, to do, uh, to provide service to a number of residents in a very short period of time. So again, uh, in the article that Kathy wrote based from his, her interviews with caregivers or healthcare providers, even for self, you know, hand washing and so forth, sanitation and so forth, they're pressed for time to do that. So it goes back to, to funding and being able to provide uh, and hire uh, workers to be able to, you know, to, to do good, uh, proper proper job and, and not rushed uh, uh, to do this because there are other residents waiting for their care. Yeah. Edward here has, you know, has, uh, has a point. Okay, so beyond rights and benefits as workers, I think the advocacy initiatives may also need to focus on ensuring that temporary foreign workers are doing the job they have been trained and educated to do and not be subjected to any forms of deep professionalization to fill in low paying jobs. Um, so just before we go to the advocacy piece, I just want to, you know, to step a little, uh, to step back a little bit and talk about the temporary foreign workers program and, and, and you know, why the, there is this disparity between, uh, between those who are coming in to fill in the jobs as temporary workers and those who are here already 
doing the job. First of all, um, it is very beneficial, whether it's an institution or a private home, to, to hire um, a registered nurse, for example, in the Philippines to come as a caregiver. First of all, the Canada does not recognize, you know, uh, international trained and international profession, you know, by the workers coming in. So even if Jasser, for example, is a nurse and comes here under the temporary foreign worker program, she, he would be treated as a temporary worker uh, and paid minimum pay, which is about $14.75, as opposed to recognizing his international trained profession and being paid 40 bucks an hour or more. So that alone, you know, uh, poses, you know, this, this, this parity uh, in terms of benefits and wages, but at the same time, he is expected to provide care and do a job as a, as, as a registered nurse. So not only that, you know, the family is saving, the government is also promoting this uh, so that they're bringing in low paid, low waged workers doing the same job as, you know, nurses or, or healthcare providers. And, and for the past, you know, um, 10 years, Canada has stopped bringing more permanent residents to fill in these jobs, but rather has brought in more and more international or temporary foreign workers. And, and these workers are contributing to um, income tax, contributing to EI, and contributing to CPP. And yet not many of them are able to access, you know, any of these benefits that they're paying to. So going, going to, you know, the work that Kairos has been doing, for years we've been advocating uh, that the government stop choosing the temporary foreign worker program, but rather bring in workers as permanent residents because we need them. And, and you know, joining, you know, other groups, other migrant justice seekers, you know, we've been, uh, we've been campaigning that permanent residency should be provided to all workers who are coming into Canada. Just very recently, um, we wrote uh, a letter to the three federal ministers who are who have direct oversight to the temporary foreign workers program, and this is the minister of uh, immigration, uh, refugee, and citizenship Canada, to the minister of agriculture and agri food, to the minister of um, service Canada and employment and development, telling asking them you know, to make sure that during this pandemic, any and all of the benefits, aid packages that, you know, both the federal and the provincial government has put in place, this worker should be able to have access, especially, you know, the likes of, of, of Chasser, who until now does not have a valid uh, um, health insurance. And I'm not sure if your SIN is, you know, uh, is valid now, Chasser, now that, you know, the, the, the opening of the class has been extended to September. So to be able to apply for a CERB or the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, you have to have a valid SIN or is, yeah. And, and this also puts in place or at risk, more at risk, already vulnerable workers, especially those undocumented workers who came to Canada legally, worked as a temporary foreign worker, uh, workers and had fallen in the cracks. Uh, and now they don't have legal status, they don't have SIN, and now they cannot apply for any of, you know, uh, the aid packages. So our letter uh, that's addressed to, this, uh, to the three federal ministers is calling, you know, for them to make sure that vulnerable workers, particularly those who have no valid SIN or undocumented refugees and international students should have access to the benefits because we are all in this together. We are all impacted, but those vulnerable workers have more 
you know, are impacted more than, you know, uh, than the rest of us. The other thing that, you know, we've been calling for is to make sure that the agricultural workers are coming you know, to work in the farms because the season is starting, that they should be provided uh, all the measures that, you know, uh, to ensure their health and, and safety, to ensure that there's enough space in their accommodation uh, that would warrant, uh, you know, the physical distancing and that when they are, you know, isolated uh, as soon as they come, that they should be paid for the time that they are in isolation. So these are, you know, uh, these are in, in, um, embedded in the letter that we sent to, uh, to the three ministers. But as what we are hearing now, despite, you know, pronouncements that the packages are inclusive to these workers, to the temporary workers, we heard it from Jasser, we're, we're hearing it from other people, uh, they are still facing to have access. They are still not included. So one of our main advocacy call is, you know, for, for the federal government to grant permanent status uh, uh, to all temporary workers, international students, and refugees during this pandemic. So that there's no discrimination. So that when someone, you know, calls for assistance, they not, don't have to go through the screening process that Jasser, you know, experienced that despite the fact that, you know, he, he contracted the virus while working in a long-term facility, he is still in, excluded from, you know, from the services. So these are, you know, these are the advocacy calls that, you know, we have, we have put out there. Uh, the letter that we sent to the government is, you know, on our website. And I'm wondering if Cheryl, can you, you know, if you had, Anything to add? Yes, thank you, Connie. Um, and thank you to all uh, the people who shared. Um, I, uh, we've been working, uh, in addition to the letter that uh, Connie referred to uh, on an op-ed, um, and we're shopping that around right now, but it looks likely um, that the Globe and Mail will print a letter that Connie had submitted. And the letter calls for two things. Uh, one is for Canada to take a page off of Portugal's book and grant all migrants uh, permanent, uh, sorry, not, uh, not, not permanent, but uh, resident status during the pandemic. Um, and that would give um, all um, migrant workers access to um, all social benefits and health benefits. And then also calling for um, permanent um, residents for all migrant workers. Um, and that it not only includes uh, caregivers, but um, agricultural workers and meat processing um, workers as well. So um, the Globe and Mail did give indication that they would be printing it, hopefully. So once that's done, um, we're thinking of uh, encouraging people to send that letter, um, which is published in a major ma uh, newspaper, to their members of parliament um, and calling for those two things. Um, so we'll likely be creating a page, an advocacy page, uh, to provide folks with uh, details on, on what to do and how to access their MP's email. Um, and hopefully we'll have that done by uh, this week. Um, so crossing the fingers that the Globe Mail will actually print this, at, but at any rate, we'll, we'll have an advocacy call uh, regardless of whether they print it or not. And I'd like to just jump in and remind folks that um, Connie and Cheryl have been sending messages to everyone on our list who has expressed interest in migrant justice. And the way you can let us know about that if uh, you are not already on our uh, email list, you can just go to the front page of the Kairos website, and I can dig up the link in a moment, but, and uh, subscribe to the newsletter, and be sure to check off Migrant Justice under the interest areas. And of course, anything else that you're interested in as well, in terms of the work that we do. 
And that way you'll be sure to get the messages, um, all of the messages that are regarding migrant justice. Um, and of course you can, don't need to wait for Kairos to take the initiative in terms of letters and petitions, but always uh, letters to your local paper um, and letters to your local MP in support of these messages are always welcome. Connie and Cheryl, do you have anything else to add in that regard? Only just the importance of letting your MP know. And I know that this is a, a challenging time and your MP or MPs are very focused on the, um, the immediate needs of their constituents, but um, the more they hear um, from their constituents on this issue or on any important issue like this one, um, the more they will take notice. And um, uh, obviously uh, the need is very high right now. Um, and certainly it's appropriate to, to let them know that this is, this is a very important issue that requires attention immediately. Um, I just want uh, um, you to know that um, I, I've spoken to um, the management of the care facility that uh, Jazzer uh, worked up and I told him, I, I told them that Jazzer should be treated as one of the staff of that facility and should, you know, receive all the support and care that the facility has extended to, you know, to their staff who had contracted or who, 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 was, who were tested positive. And I'm hoping, Jasser, that, you know, they will do this soon. <laughs> but, but again, it, it, it highlights really uh, the disparity uh, between those with status and those without. And, and we have to fight this injustice. And, 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 you know, um, we want you to be with us. Carlos has been doing this uh, for years now, and we are, we are quite successful in some of the, you know, uh, the, the issues that you, we, we, we faced and advocated. For example, when they changed the, the caregiver pilot program uh, from the previous one to a new one that, was, that has taken effect last June, 2019, um, caregivers are now, those who apply after June, 9, June 2019, they are now processed as permanent resident applicants. And, and after completing the 24 months job requirement, uh, they will ease in to become, you know, permanent residents. And this also changes, you know, the fact that uh, workers under the caregiver program who, who come to Canada uh, will be able to bring, you know, their children and their spouses with them uh, through work permits and study permits to, to respond to uh, the separation, the long period of separation issue. So uh, we're hoping that, you know, uh, faced with the pandemic and all the issues that, you know, it, 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 it kind of, uh, how do you say that? Um, the injustice issues that we are seeing now, that you know, it they were there before, but now it's right in front of us. Uh, that you know, changes will be made, and this can only happen with you know, with the broadest possible support that we can gather. So the letters to the MPs that Cheryl that Cheryl mentioned earlier, um, it's something that we would like to do, and would like to reach out to you uh, for support. For, for the participants who are, who are here coming from different places across Canada, we, we would like to call on you <laughs> to support us. And you can always, you know, call on us to for, for resources, support and information that, you know, uh, that you need. Uh, Thank you very much, Connie, and everyone for coming. We are planning uh, the next uh, Migrant Justice Update and webinar for uh, May 19th, and we'll hope you will join us. So we will um, update our uh, events calendar shortly, where you'll be able to get the um, where you'll be able to get the registration link, as well as 
sending an email out to everyone who has registered or clicked on that migrant justice area in the subscribe. So thanks very much for being with us, everyone. And Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much to Zavia and to Jasmine so for sharing your stories. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye.